Welcome to the pitfalls of partnerships. My name is David Wilkinson. I'm one of the co-founders here at the Hemp Business Advisors, and I'm excited to talk to you today about partnerships. When was the moment that you believed that partnerships were the best way or worst way to grow your business? Now, I was thinking about this talk and the opening illustration, and the first thought that popped into my head was back in 1989. I was with my father. I was 16 years old, and he flew us up to Chicago. He's a major nonprofit leader at the largest nonprofit in his sector. And he invited all of the other presidents and founders of other major nonprofits together. So we walked into a room about 150 different companies. And uh, man, you know when you can feel ego? I mean, just just some some people that really care about other people, but they have a lot of agendas. And that's kind of how the room was. But they, they had been given an opportunity uh, across the globe, and uh, so they decided to come together. And over the next two days, I watched my father take 150 different directions of these different leaders and slowly and surely, through conversation, find the common ground and come up with the single overall vision for the opportunity in which people were willing to share things that they had never shared before such as their database of their donors. And I watched men and women who were leaders in their industries come together for a common purpose. And when I saw that, I said, wow, you can really make a difference when you have the right partnerships. So I have a passion for this topic. And I'm excited to, to talk to you about some of the truths that we have in here um, because we've heard so many amazing stories since we've been in the hemp and cannabis space over the last three years about some amazing partnerships and some absolute disasters. So um, hopefully you have your notes there. Um, we emailed everybody your notes unless you just signed up in the last hour. So hopefully you got that. And um, we have Carrie Cox and Michaela Wilkinson, which are co-founders, which will um, be able to help you. So please raise your hand or chat there under the more button and we will get back to you immediately. All right. So here's some of the concepts that we want to talk to you about uh, today in this hour. Some introductory thoughts and then we're going to talk about partnership return on investments. Uh, how do you know that you're in the right partnerships? Uh, the different styles. We're going to talk about four different partnership styles. What are some pitfalls that you need to prepare for? What is a formulation that you can figure out which style best matches each person or company? A partnership agreement, how to form one and how to get signatures for that and some concluding thoughts. So this is a very practical uh, talk and the notes will help you literally craft your own partnership um, so that you ensure that you don't have any regrets long term. Because I don't know about you, but partnerships for me is, is a real value. And I've seen how our company has exploded with the right partnerships. And the wrong partnerships just fizzle out and die, or you put a lot of time, effort, money into it, and it just doesn't seem to produce. So we want to be protected against those, those types of fake partnerships. And we want to go towards the real partnerships and, and partner with the people that we're excited about partnering with, in which it's a, a mutually beneficial, be, beneficial partnership. So hopefully you're ready for some of these ideas. And thank you for joining us today. So here's the introduction. Um, when I say the word cannabis, I'm talking about you know cannabis and I'm talking about hemp and I'm talking about CBD, anything underneath the brand. So I'm just going to use cannabis for this talk and it includes everyone and anything underneath that industry. So it is one of the most collaborative and community-oriented industries in the world. For those of you like us that came out of general business, um, partnerships were there, but um, it was not as anywhere close to the collaborative nature um, that the cannabis space is. Because you've got entrepreneurs, scientists, manufacturers, farmers, and ancillary businesses, they all come together, and when you sit in with different meetings, they're sharing their best practices and some of their industry secrets that they found because they want the whole industry to go higher. Uh, for those of you that have been in the industry like we have three years, you're ancient in this industry. It's only been, uh, hemp's only been legal for less than that time. So, um, you know, what we have found is this is an industry based upon passion. In fact, um, I just hopefully talked someone out of getting into the cannabis space uh, two weeks ago. 
gentleman, very sharp, knows what he's doing in the financial arena. And I said to him, I said, uh, he's, he said to me, how can I get involved in this industry? I, I can bring this, 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 um, this is what I can do. And I said, listen, it's not that you're not needed in the industry, but I've got one question. How has the canvas plant impacted you personally? And what is your story? And he said to me, oh no, this is just all about the money. And I said, well, if it's all about the money, I would encourage you not to get involved in this industry. Um, I said, y y you're not going to make it. The people that are involved in the cannabis industry are so passionate about what they do. And therefore, what we have formed is partnerships based upon trust. And there, there are handshakes. You know, in our grandfather's and great grandfather's day, they weren't, there were no agreements. There were no contracts. You know, if you were a farmer and you were partnering with, uh, you know, a company that was going to help you with equipment, um, you shook a, you shook the hand of the person. You said, this is what I believe in. This is who I am. And you literally formed a partnership because of your handshake, because your name was connected to that handshake. Now that works when it's with the right partners. But if you find the wrong people and you do a handshake and the person has no integrity, it, what does it cost you? What does it cost your company? So let's take a look at this. So our team has connected with one too many bewildered business owners who were taken advantage of. They had their ideas hijacked, were betrayed by their own team members, or realized too late that money had literally been stolen out of their accounts. So we're going to focus on the external partnerships in, in this presentation. This is part one of a two-part webinar. So what this is about is this is about you as an individual, as a business person, your company, going outside of that and looking for individuals and companies to partner with externally. That's what we're going to focus on is the external. Uh, part two is going to be on the internal, which is how do you ensure that you hire the right people and that they're there long term so you don't have high staff turnover. So that will be um, coming up in June. Okay. So here's the opening question. What's the first picture that pops into your mind when you think about the word partnership? So take your notes there and write down two or three ideas, just, just a simple words. What is the first animal that pops into your head? What's the, what's the first thought that pops into your head when you think about the word partnership? Write down a couple of those just real quick, just jot some down. Well, this is kind of what some people think about when they think about the word partnership. They say there's blood in the water. This is the green rush. It's time for everyone to get involved. And here you have all these people who have impure motives that are all greedy and they're looking for partnerships for the naive to gobble up like sharks, you know, watching a small bait fish that's limping along in the water. Um, if you've ever been taken advantage of in a partnership, you may say, you know what? It was just like a shark. I didn't see them coming. They were slick. They were smooth. They had charisma and they ended up, um, taking advantage of me and my company. And we've met people just like you have that have actually lost their company and have gone out of the cannabis space because the partnership hindered them so deeply as a person. They said, you know what? It's not worth it. I'm not ever coming back again. Maybe it's like this. You're saying, oh my goodness, am I going to have to share my financials with people I just met? It's exposure. It's, you know, if I, if I partner with somebody else, what if they ask all these questions and now I feel like I'm naked, that they can see everything on the inside of my company? Or maybe you think about it like this. It's a strategy. And when you partner with the right people, you can gain more market share by partnering with the right people and you can dominate the marketplace. Or maybe it's just you're saying, oh my gosh, the thought of one more partnership that fails. I, you know, I don't even, it's like painful. I just don't know if I want to do it. So regardless of what your picture is, it might be how you were raised. It's your value system. It's what you've been able to see so far in the industry. So whatever your words were and whatever your pictures were, hopefully by the time we're done with this talk, that you will ask yourself the question, am I willing to try different styles of partnerships? Because maybe why some of them have been working and some of them have been failing hasn't been because of lack of trying. 
maybe it's been because the styles haven't been complementary. So let's take a look at some of the ideas here. So here is the first, uh, the first point of partnership ROIs, your return on investment. How do you know if a partnership has been successful? So for those of you that love notes, you love filling out, uh, you know, you love filling out the, the blanks. This is for you. For those of you that don't enjoy notes, please don't fill them out. No pressure. We're not going to stand there and ask you at the end of this webinar, what, you know, what is the fill in that most changed your life? <laughs> so, so what's your internal ROI meter? It dictates how you feel about each partnership. So what I want you to do now is I want you to think about what are your ROIs that maybe are unique from these next six ROIs that you want to look at. So here's the first feeling. How much fun have you been having with the company that you partnered with? Is, is it fun for you? When you think about a partnership, if you go like this, oh no, another email just came in from this person. Or, oh no, they texted me, I think I'll ignore it. Or there's a phone call coming in, I'll send it the voicemail. That's not a good partnership. It ought to be when you think about the partner that you say, you know what, that's fun. You know, for me, what this is, is it's a client. I look upon every person that pays our company any amount of money as a partnership. That's just who I am. That's a value that I have. So when I think about receiving money from a company for coaching or consulting, or no matter what we do, it needs to be that I like the person. I, that I say, oh man, this is great. And I can't wait to talk to the person or Zoom them or email them. And when I see an email pop in, I'm like, oh, I wonder what they've broken through with now. So I hope that when you think about partnerships, that they're exciting for you and you enjoy the people. That's one of your ROIs. Number two, how much money have you been making from the company? If you've been in a partnership and you've been expecting some type of ROI when it comes to finances, how long will you wait before you get paid? So that's another one. Uh, a third one is how much trust has been created between you and the other leader, between your company and this company. Is there trust there? And you know, sometimes in the beginning, there's full trust until the for first project um, is being created. And then you see the delivery of the company that said they were gonna do all these things. And then you say, you know what? I lost my trust in the ability of our partnership because they did not produce what they said they were going to produce. Number four, how many opportunities has the company brought to your company? How many? So if they bring you lots and lots and lots of opportunities and you don't know how to close the sale, then that has to do with you. But if they're bringing you really, uh, you know, uh, opportunities that aren't real opportunities, they're just kind of sending them to you and hoping that you feel like they're good opportunities and nothing pans out, that might not be a very good partnership. And this is an important one. Partnerships are about relationships, especially when we get to the different styles. Uh, if you've been in a partnership with a company over a year, I'm hoping that you really know the people well, that you want to spend time with them, that when you talk about things and you implement a new idea as the partnership, that the relationship grows deeper. And lastly, how many accomplishments have already taken place? You know, when you have a really great partnership, and it's really complex. It takes a while before you get to a place where you're ready to launch something and to accomplish something. But if it's something that's really on the fly and it's creative and you're doing all kinds of new ideas and you're implementing things and they're happening right there, it's really exciting because you can see your ROI with accomplishments sometimes on the first day that you meet with the person. So these are just six of some light ROIs that if you feel like this is a fun, you know, this is working, you like the people, it's building deeper relationship, there's new opportunities, there's new revenue, then you're going to say, wow, what a great partnership. Just some ROIs to think about. Now, your intrinsic value system dictates your specific partnership affinity, and this impacts your revenue. In other words, if you were raised and you've seen partnerships exhibited before you as you, as you grew up and you started out business and <clears throat> you're 18 or 19 or 20 and you saw some great partnerships, you're going to want to partner with other people. But if you've seen person after person get screwed and they lost money and, and, and they lost their business and you saw the pain and the agony and when you tried your first partnership, it failed miserably, 
it may be that you don't want to go down this road because you're saying, you know what, how can I be sure that partnerships are the right way to grow my company? And there's a style for you. So we're going to look at the different types of partnerships, how you can see the complementary and conflicting styles. So here is uh, the four different areas that we're going to look at here. So the first one I want to talk to you about is it called a transactional style partnership. And this is something in which the person says to you, hey, you got a great product, a great service. I'm going to send you leads. And all of a sudden, you're going to get somebody who says, hey, somebody, Bob, sent me, Joe, to come buy from you. That's a transactional partnership. Rarely is there referral fees. It just happens because you do good you do good work. You have a great company, good products, good services. And it's just you send people to the right other partners that you have transactional relationships, and they do the same for you. It's just about goodwill. Number two is the word creative. And this is when you go a little bit deeper into uh, the type of partnership that you have. And we're gonna talk about what the grid is, what that looks like, but this is when you bring the best of your ideas to a group of people or to another company, and you're wanting to create a partnership that may turn into something larger down the road. The third type of partnership that we're gonna discuss in the next couple slides is the word transformational partnership. And this is when you take a vested interest in another company or in a group of companies, whereby you're going to literally craft referrals on behalf of that person. So you're going to actually put your branding on their website and vice versa. This is a partnership where you will make money together. And when they send out a newsletter, they have you as a spotlight and vice versa. So it's transformational and we'll talk more in depth about that in a couple minutes. And then lastly, it's the word collaborative. And that's when you are not expecting any financial gain whatsoever out of it. Uh, you may get some referrals from it, but that's not the point. You have found a vision in which other people are surrounding that you believe in so much that you don't care about the money. You care about the vision and the impact of your life with that group. You know, when you're young, it's all about the money. Typically a partnership, if it doesn't produce anything, you're like, well, then why am I in it in the first place? But as you get older and older, there's something called leaving a lasting legacy. That when you're dead and gone, you want to ensure that your concepts, your ideas, your leadership, actually makes difference in the world after you're gone. And that's what collaboration is all about. You can't not do a collaborative partnership. The concept has captured you. The people, the team is so amazing. And you say this, you know what? I'm going to pour my life. I'm going to have my business get behind this. And we're going to make this work because it's going to make a difference uh, in the world. So those are the four different types of partnerships. And now what I want to do, I was going to take each of them individually and you're going to look at the graph and see which one uh, you most adhere to. Because here's the thing, based upon your personality type and the experiences you've had with other partnerships will be based upon which one of the four you naturally gravitate to. And there's going to be one that you say, oh, that's not me. I rarely ever do that one. There's not a right or wrong here. This is partnerships. Um, you're going to be doing maybe all four of them with four different companies. And you know what I've learned? <clears throat> Sometimes in the beginning, you may just have a transactional partnership to see whether or not the people actually do what they say. And that transactional partnership can move around the spectrum and you can actually go from transactional all the way around to collaborative in a short period of time if the people meet your expectations. And we're going to talk about that a little later as well. So partnership styles, here's what it is. Transactional. Here's the description. This is a lead based partnership where names and contacts are forwarded when applicable. Um, I've got a transactional relationship right now um, with, with a gentleman named uh, Phil Gibson. And Phil has sent me in the last 60 days uh, four leads. 
all of a sudden, uh, Bob or Fred or Sarah um, shoots me an email I've never seen before. Uh, Dear David, uh, Phil Gibson gave me your contact information. He says, you guys do funding at the Hemp Business Advisors. Um, you know, can we please have a, a Zoom or a telephone call? And it just happens over and over and over. Um, it's an exchange of products and services for finances. So sometimes there's a referral fee, sometimes there's not. Um, one of the companies that we consider in this area is Alay Consulting. This is a transactional partnership. Uh, when we are in the marketplace and we're talking and somebody comes up to us and says, hey, uh, you know, I've got a manufacturing processing plant and you know what, we, we're not really sure about what the FDA is and the fire codes and we're not sure about compliance. Um, ISO 9000, who do we get in contact with? I immediately say, oh my gosh, you have to get in touch with the amazing ladies at LA Consulting. And I'll connect them with Kim and Kelsey and Sheila, and I will send that information on to them. I'm not expecting a referral fee. I'm not expecting any finances. Uh, our team knows them well. They're excellent speakers. They know what they're talking about. And it's a joy to send them that lead. So we all have transactional partnerships with a whole bunch of people in the industry because other people that excel in their sphere of influence, in their niche, they deserve those leads. And it's happy. It's happy days when we hear back from a client that says, you know what, you sent me to the right place and they did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Everybody wins. There's, a, there's no loss of transactional partnerships. It's a testing ground. It helps other people. It grows everyone's company. Now, when you come to the creative uh, partnership. Uh, this is more of a brainstorming partnership. It, it, it's when you bring the best of your ideas and you create a new company with shared equity. So if you are in a creative partnership style, here's what happens. You have a brilliant idea. If it's a true creative partnership, you give the best ideas that you have to the partnership because you believe in the partnership. You're talking about maybe getting some equity and you feel emotional ownership in the project, in the product, in the service, in the company. And therefore you do this because you believe in them. One of the companies that we're partnered with is called Black Bull Advisors. They're um, starting up different hedge funds um, and therefore uh, we've partnered with them. And there is numerous opportunities here for us to be creative, that we're creating new opportunities, new businesses with them, that we're talking about equity sharing. So here's my question. Where are your creative partnerships that you say, man, I am so excited to meet with this other person because look at the results and look at the potential that my company can grow as we partner with the right people. If you're in a creative partnership, and you have four or five really brilliant ideas and you bring them all back to your company and you don't share them with the partner that you're brainstorming with, it means it's probably not the right partner. Because when you really have full trust there and it's the right partnership, you give the best that you have to offer because you get equity from it and you have ownership in the concept. So let's look at number three. This is the word transformational, transformational partnership. So this is a referral-based partnership where co-branding is accepted, encouraged. You exchange your knowledge and skills for revenue and profit share. And there's two uh, different type of, of partnerships we have with this transformation. One is uh, our partner who is in charge of the, a $24 billion hedge fund. And the manager and I are personal friends. When we first started, I thought it was going to be a transactional partnership. You know, David, I want you as the hemp business advisors, you, you and your team are going to go out there and look for cannabis businesses looking for investment. And then I'm going to pay you a referral fee. And that's not at all what it turned out to be. It is where we talk sometimes two or three times on the phone per week. Um, we share best practices. We share war stories. Um, we come up with new ideas how to help the industry. Um, you know, he only was able to, um, invest $196 million in the, in the cannabis industry last year. And he's so frustrated because he's got billions and, and he cannot find the right people that understand the word partnership that he can fund. And therefore we're trying to screen out all of the flakes, all the people that aren't serious of the industry and find the gold. 
that says, oh, you know what? These people have done their due diligence. They're ready for the funding. And then we partner with them and partner with the hedge fund. Another one is called uh, Point Three Group. And that's with Sam Bernie. And Sam and I, as soon as I met Sam, we immediately became friends and colleagues. And just this morning, I mean, like an, less than an hour ago, he sent us a direct referral. And I was like, you know, hey, I just wanted to let you know, Sam, just a reminder, you know, thanks so much for partnering with us. And by the way, we give a, a finder's fee for this. I know that's not your point. That's not your purpose is the money. But thanks for doing that. And there is an exchange and we sell clones for him. And so when somebody says, David, where's a great clone company? We're like, oh my gosh, you got to go with Point Three Group. These guys sold out last year. They did a fantastic job. You've got to call Sam. So that's a type of tran transformational partnership. And the last is very unique. It's called collaborative. And I hope, um, I hope you're not in many of these. Uh, these can literally take all of your time. <laughs> now, if, you, if you're really busy like we are, we're busier today than we have been in the last three years. Um, I don't know what happened with the virus, but for the cannabis industry, it's exploded. There are so many people that are growing their businesses, that are looking for funding, they're looking for coaching, they're coming up with brand new strategies they never thought of before because they're waiting for this little bubble to pop so that they can really go big. And so what happens with collaborative partnerships? is that you meet a person who has a vision that's not your own, that as soon as you hear about it, you say, oh, I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. And it literally becomes a calling. It may have nothing to do with your gift mix or your skills or your background or your experience. It just, when you hear it, you met the person, you said, I, I got to help them. So this is a recruitment-based partnership where others are persuaded to join in the effort or project. Um, and for me, that is CPPC, which is the Cannabis Public Policy Conference. When I walked into that room, it was right before the virus hit and all, everything was, was canceled and we have to wear a mask like we're, like we're um, you know, going in and robbing every store we walk into. Um, so I went to this two-day Cannabis Public Policy Conference. Now, if you know who I am, I'm a very non-political um, I'm, I'm a kind of a free flowing person, but I really love professional and I really love things to be done right. And I, um, kind of walked in with some bias about a cannabis public policy conference. And I said, Oh my gosh, I know I'm supposed to come to this thing, but I hope it's not boring. And I, and I hope it's not about, you know, 50 different bong sets you can buy. You know, I, I hope that there's some professionals here. I hope that we can collaborate together. And I walked in with all these different ideas. And here's what happened. While I was there, I saw the best of the cannabis industry than what I could possibly imagine. I saw people sharing best business practices. I saw professional people. I saw people that cared about the health and welfare of others who loved the plant and wanted to go to, and were directly involved in Washington, helping the country to become more healthy and get off of opioids and how to market appropriately. And by the time it was done, I walked up to the founder, Michael Scanlon, and I said, Michael, I, I have to be involved with this. I have to be on leadership. I'll do whatever you want me to do, but I have to be involved. I will exchange my unique expertise as being a coach for 20 plus years of having events around the world. Um, I don't want any money. I just want to help you grow the impact across the cannabis industry. And that became a collaborative project that I think about every day. And I am recruiting people without trying. I'm telling other people, have you heard about this? Have you heard about this? And I don't even try. It just gushes out because uh, it, the, the collaborative nature of this partnership causes me not to be silent about what's taking place. Well, what does this look like practical? What does it look practically? Well, before we go in and find out what it's, we're actually going to take for these four different styles, we need to look at some lacking components. So what are some pitfalls of partnerships? And here's the first fill-in, lack of contemplation. Lack of contemplation. Past failed partnerships without proper reflection will cause unsuccessful future ones. 
Find the line between your responsibility and their incompetency. About six months ago, I was working with a cannabis company and we were talking about doing um, an event series across America. I had my mutual NDA signed by both co-founders. Um, we had our uh, partnership agreement signed. Uh, they, they both signed it. And uh, we worked for three weeks to ramp up to a final conclusion in which on the third week we, we knew exactly what we we're going to do, how we were going to do it. Everything was set in stone. We got our dates done. And um, at that point, they dropped the ball. Um, we had a, a series of weekly uh, Zoom meetings that we we're having every single week, and they canceled all the Zoom meetings. They wouldn't return my phone calls. They wouldn't return texts. They wouldn't return emails. And um, just today, I decided to go online and look at their website. And uh, lo and behold, they stole our ideas. They, they took them. They, uh, I failed in the partnership because I believed that when somebody signs a mutual NDA and signs a partnership agreement, uh, adhering to the guidelines that we agreed upon, that they would do what they said and they didn't. And so I've contemplated on that. And I've said over the last six months, what did I do to fail? Or did I give away too much information too quickly? I, I thought that the signed documents proved that they were serious. They, they signed on the dotted line. We signed the mutual NDA. We signed the agreement. What happened? So this has happened to us numerous times. It's my lack of contemplation that's allowed some of our secrets to get stolen by other people in the cannabis industry because I didn't find the line between other people's unethical behavior and my responsibility not to share too much information. So if you have had numerous poor partnerships where people took your ideas or they stole money from you or anything like that, before you go into your next partnership, you need to contemplate, write down what really happened. Think about it, talk to somebody else, vent to them about it. Say, listen, I'm so angry about this, I'm frustrated about this, and get the gold nuggets of how it actually happened. Otherwise, if you don't contemplate, you're in a series of failure ships. And if you have more than three failed partnerships in a row, that's called a pattern, <laughs> which means if it's three in a row, A, B, C, there's one common denominator. That's you. <laughs> and you're the person that's causing the partnerships not to work. So, um, and this is true, by the way, when you hire somebody. If you, the last three people you hired are no longer with the company, you need to contemplate about part two on pitfalls of partnerships of how to recruit, screen, how do you train, how you retain the right people. And if you don't contemplate on where you've been failing with your hiring, you're going to continue to hire people. They're going to walk in, take your ideas and go somewhere else. And those are failed internal partnerships. Okay. Number two. Lack of communication. Fill in is communication. Barriers, walls, and clarity regarding expectations is crucial. If there is someone who, after this uh, pitfalls of partnership, sends us an email and says, David, loved your webinar. You know what? You really speak my heart. You speak my language. You know what? I've been saying the same types of things for many years. And I think we have something that we can work together on. Okay. Uh, it's going to take a lot of communication before it's time to sign a document. And the reason why is, is really interesting. I can make a sentence and there's a, a trigger word in there. And that trigger would, word, I might, I might not even know about it, and it might trigger the other person in a negative or positive way because they have a different definition in a story behind that word. The more you communicate to your four different types of partners in the partnerships, the, 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 the barriers should begin to come down with you and those people and to where you gain clarity of who you are, what your business is looking for, what your company is really seeking to do, and them. And it should slowly start to come together, and the communication is like this, to where you're one as partners, and you go 
forward together and you think the same thoughts and you're, you're, you're there on behalf of the whole company. You know, um, we have an amazing extraction company that we're in partnership right now. We're providing executive coaching um, uh, with a couple of their team members. And I met with the CEO a couple of weeks ago and we sat down and we started talking and I said to her, you know, I need to apologize because what I said that we could do and what we did were two different things. And then I shared with her all of the things that we accomplished because of these things that were missing. And I said to her, I said, it was my fault. I assumed we were at this level wanting to go to this level. We were at this level wanting to go to this level. And so I apologized to her. I communicated to her and said, I can now do what I said because we've now built that foundation. It was that what I set up as an expectation was not met. And because those weren't met, I had to apologize as a businessman, as a CEO to another CEO and say, this is something that is my fault. And I apologize. I communicated an expectation we were not able to meet. And when you're honest with your partnerships, they will respect you more. When you fail, be open and honest about it. And when you succeed, celebrate together. But partnerships are a great way how you can learn how to communicate to other people that hopefully have your best interest in mind and that they're safe. They're safe people that when you fail, they grieve with you and they say, it's going to be okay. And we're going to, we're going to help each other go to the next level. And when you succeed, you know, high fives, round of drinks and, and let's celebrate together. And let's remember the good old days when we used to fail. <laughs> All right. A couple more lacking components, lack of concentration. Okay, I was on a, a Zoom meeting uh, just about a week and a half ago with four gentlemen that are starting a hedge fund, and I was uh, taking notes because I'm writing an operation manual for them, and I was listening. I didn't say anything for the whole hour and a half, and at the very end, the leader um, that was leading these, these, this other group to start this you know, says to me, David, you know, you've been coaching for over 20 years, these 250 different companies. Is there anything you'd like to add? And I said, yes. In the next two weeks, there's no agenda. There's no goals. There's no deadlines. What are three things that your group of five needs to accomplish in the next 14 days that you know you have either succeeded or failed as you start the hedge fund? And there was silence. And then they started talking. Then they came up with three different goals with the deadline of two weeks. And then they knew, knew what their agenda was. <clears throat> when you meet with someone for a partnership, if you walk away from the meeting and say this, you know, I don't really know why I met these people. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I got accomplished. Um, that's not a good sign. Uh, Michael and I met uh, last week for lunch and, and we were talking about all these different ideas. And by the time the two hours was, were over, we had gone through the page of our agenda and we had a whole bunch of other things to do in the next week. And we walked away with an agenda and goals and deadlines. And he was excited and I was excited. And it was like, oh, this is awesome. There was focus concentration. So when you go into a partnership meeting, my encouragement, Go in with an agenda that you've either emailed before, you bring a printout that has goals and deadlines so that you know the level of commitment and where the different people and organizations are in your level of partnerships. Otherwise, you can waste a lot of time without anything to prove for it. And lastly, lack of closure. Closure is the fill-in. Ending a partnership could end in disaster, relief, or celebration. <laughs> Okay, listen, not every single partnership that I've ever been in uh, ended wonderfully. Uh, sometimes the, the partnership ended and I was like, oh my gosh, there was so much collateral damage. I don't even know where to start. I mean, it was like a small nuclear explosion and everybody got upset about it. and It was terrible. Oh. Sometimes it's like, oh gosh, I'm so glad that's over. I, I, I hope I never get in a partnership, partnership like that again. And sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, we accomplished the goal. It was fantastic. I'm so thrilled that it ended this way. And the project's done. The partnership's over. So here's my question. When you look at all your different partnerships, do you have an exit strategy if you know that this is not something you want to do long term? So you need to establish an exit strategy up front if you believe this is a timeline that you say, I want to be in this partnership from this point until we accomplish it and here's the deadline. 
so that you can open yourself up for longer term partnerships. That can give you a successful framework after the project is complete where there's no regrets. There's no sorrow or sadness if you're supposed to end the partnership. And sometimes partnerships that end will create a new different type of partnership with some of the people because they have a different vision because they've all grown in the partnership. So make sure that you close with excellence if you're supposed to. All right. So A plus B plus C plus D equals success. And that's your partnership formulation. So I want to talk to you about four different areas right now that will help you decide what person and what company fit into the four different areas of transfer, uh, transactional, creative, transformational, and collaborative. So here's what the first one is. Here's your first fill-in. The duration of time that it's going to take to be in the partnership. So in, in my mind, well, I'm giving at least four hours every single week to, to uh, the Cannabis Public Policy Conference. Every week I've got it in my schedule. I've got two Zoom meetings of at least an hour each, and I have another two hours that I focus on doing the work. And it's a half a day a week. And that's what I want to put in is a minimum of about two days per month. Um, if you're busy like we're busy, to tell anyone you're going to give them a half a day a month means you are serious about the partnership. Now, if you say this, oh man, I don't, I don't want to give this partnership any time. I mean, it, 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 I don't think it's worth it. Well, we're going to talk about why that is in a couple of minutes. All right, number two, the extent of effort. Now listen, in the beginning, and not all partnerships are easy. Sometimes it's like taking a huge, huge ball of concrete and you're pushing it with a team up the hill because you say, once we get the ball up over the hill and the tipping point happens, it is going to be worth it. So the extent of the amount of energy, the effort that you're going to put into something has to do also with the level of partnership that you're going to choose to get involved with. Number three is the volume of money. Not the amount of money you're going to make, the amount of money you're going to put into something. You know, over and over and over when somebody, you know, we charge people all the time for our services and they're flabbergasted. I mean, you know, I don't know why this is, but in the cannabis space, I, I know we're one big happy family and we are all, we're all laid back people and we love each other. We love the plant and the planet and the people. It's just awesome. But you know, some of us have bills and, 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 and so sometimes you got to pay those bills or things happen that are negative. So here's the thing, before you put money into a partnership, you've got to be completely convinced it's worth the money. So if you put money into something and you don't expect anything out of it, it's okay. That's a certain type of partnership. But if you put money into it and it's a lot of money and you're going to give over a long period of time, you better ensure that what your expectations are for the revenue needs to equal what you're putting into it. Number four, D, the level of results. I don't mean the level of results for your company. I'm talking about the level of results of the product, of the partnership. You know, sometimes um, I've been in partnership with people in which I've put tons of time, effort, money, and there were no results. And it wasn't impactful. And it was a very bad collaborative partnership. Other times, I put almost no time, almost no effort, and no money, and have had significant results. It's different with every person in every partnership. Question, what are your expectations? Because if you don't know what your partnership formulation is per person, you possibly are sticking people and companies in the wrong category and then getting frustrated saying partnerships don't work. Partnerships are flawless when you know what your formula is. So. A plus B plus C plus D equals the type of partnership um, that you're going to choose per situation. You know, sometimes a partnership is just for an event. And you say, you know what, I'm going to give, uh, this is uh, like, like uh, the Olympics, whenever those take place next. If you were on the leadership committee of the, uh, for your city and, and, and you were chosen to have the Olympics at your city, and you say, listen, I'm going to put a ton of time, effort, money um, to produce the, the, the I mean, this is going to be the best ever for the Olympics. 
and you don't make any money from it. And you're like, I don't care about the money. I care about the results of having this, that people come from all over the world, all these nations and come to our city where it's going to change our state and it'll never be the same again. Then you know what your expectations are. It's when you don't know what your formulation is per person and company that you have disappointments from your partnerships and they don't produce the results, the results that you are expecting. And that might be because you don't know what your own formulation formulation is, or even that you haven't communicated that to someone else so they know whether or not you are thrilled with the partnership or not. So here's the grid time T M for money E for effort and R for results. So here's what it is. Transactional. Transactional is you're going to put almost no time whatsoever into the partnership. No money, no effort, and you're not expecting any results. So here's, here's why I use LA Consulting. I use LA Consulting because they're experts in their area. And therefore, when I, when I, when I meet Bob in the marketplace, I think I meet a lot of Bobs. I always use his name. Um, I, <laughs> I, I meet Bob and Bob, is, it, we're talking about coaching. We're talking about consulting. We're talking about growing your company because this is the best time ever to be in the cannabis industry to grow because so many people um, are doing research about what we can do and what the plant does. It's amazing. And therefore, when I talk to Bob, he says, listen, I'm, I have some you know, compliance challenges I'm going to say, you know what, Bob, when I get back to the office, I'm going to shoot an email to Lay Consulting and I'm going to connect you with them. It takes me what, 15 seconds to type, 30 seconds, okay, maybe a minute. It took me zero time to make the connection. I don't expect any money. I don't, it's no effort. I don't expect any results for my company. I expect these two to be satisfied. They get paid for their expertise. And this man still has a business because he's running it right because of their expertise. It's a great partnership. Number two, creative. 100% time. That is that you want to work with this partner. You want to work in the partnership. It's not going to cost you any money. It's just your time. You may sit there and spend eight hours in one day and come up with 50 different ways how you can grow the partnership. It takes a lot of effort for this type of partner partnership and you may not um, you may not have a lot of results it may take time to get your results up to 50 percent and maybe even a hundred percent it's based upon the longevity because typically creative partnerships are not about getting the equity right up front it's about creating something and as it grows it turns into something significant maybe a brand new company which you get equity in and the results flow from that uh, this is where the majority of people, um, that come to the hemp business advisors, this is actually where they're at right now. Um, when they want uh, to get funding, this is typically what they said. <coughs> well, David, we're exploding as a business. Um, you know what? We're looking for an equity partner. So um, if you can help us get, uh, you know, a million dollars. Now we've already been, you know, evaluated at a hundred million. Uh, we're going to start the company as soon as we get the investment money. Uh, we haven't opened our C, C, uh, our closed corporation yet, um, but we've been evaluated. You know, we think we're worth about a hundred million, and we want we want you to go out and get ten million dollars, and we're going to give you thirty percent equity. Um, that they're looking for a creative type partnership uh, that they want us to come in and bring our expertise about how to grow companies, about investment, about you know developing an awesome business plan and pitch deck that's going to get funded. And we have said to every single one, unfortunately, that's not how we do business. We're not looking for equity partnerships. Um, um, and for those of you that are involved in equity partnerships, um, I hope that you have learned how to start a closed corporation and to uh, distance yourself personally from that in case there are any liabilities that you've protected yourself. Okay, transformational. Is you're willing to put in 50%. You're saying, you know what, this is something that's serious for me. When the person calls, you take their phone call. You believe in the person, you believe in this, you're willing to put in 50% and they're willing to put in the other 50%. It's, it's a transformational partnership. You're willing to put some money into it because you believe in it. And when you are working with the person or the people or the companies, uh, you know, and forming that strategic alliance, that joint venture, um, you get results from that. And what you produce it satisfies you, makes you content, like a partnership should. And lastly, collaborative is by far 
takes the most toll out of every, every person that gets involved in one of these. That is that you are 100% in. If there's a crisis with one of the companies that you're in a collaborative effort with, you will stop everything and help them. When they say, hey, what do you think about this? You answer them back as quickly as you can. There is urgency in this partnership. It will take money. You will spend money because you say it's worth it. And the results are 100%. You believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you continue in this type of a partnership, that it's not about whether or not your company makes a cent. It's not about you. It's not about your company. It's not even about recognition. It's that the overall vision of what you're involved in is bigger than you and that you're excited about it. And you say, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be a part of this collaborative partnership in which we are all equal. And even though there's a leader of uh, you know, the partnership, because there needs to be a founder or somebody leading the thing, but the other people don't care about titles that much. If they get, have a title, it's just to make a bigger impact. But these four are needed in your life at all times. I guarantee you, you can take every single person in the cannabis industry of every person you know and every company that you uh, want to do business with and you can put them in one of these four. And when you do that, you will find out real quick how much time, how much money, how much effort, and how much results you expect from every partnership. There's never a person you can't partner with. If you can't trust them, you have a transactional partnership. <laughs> That's what it looks like. You're not going to put anything into it because you don't know if you can trust the person. But you know what? That's kind of what we're going to talk about in this next point, which is, well, about the agreement. Because you see, if you don't have a partnership agreement, there's a good chance that it probably won't work. So let's take a look at some of these ideas. So organizations may partner to increase the likelihood of each achieving their mission and to amplify their reach. Although not required by law, partners may benefit from a partnership agreement that defines the important terms of the relationship between them. Now here's what it is. This is not some massive legal document that's going to cost you $50,000 so that you can sue the living daylights out of people if they don't do what they say. That's not what this is. This is not a legal contract. Here's what it is. A simple one-page partnership agreement which outlines time, effort, money, results that both parties agree to fulfill. Here's what I found. We, we had a partnership we had been working on for about two months and we were wanting to work with this company and it was two gentlemen and we were, we had a lot of collaborative ideas and we're working. And um, as time went on over and over, they seemed to kind of um, put themselves in a position where they were above our company. Um, and they were saying, we need to do it this way and we need to do it this way. And all of a sudden, all these things that we had agreed upon in the beginning started to shift. And the next thing you know, they were here and we were here. And that's not kind of the partnership that we are looking for. We're not looking to be dominated in a partnership. Um, we were looking for a partnership. And uh, eventually, I called them up on the phone. Our team did. And, and uh, our, our three co-founders called them up on the phone. And we said, listen, uh, we don't believe we can do what we say because we had been put in a position that was a no-win situation. It wasn't whether or not we liked the gentleman or not. Or that they, we thought they had good ideas. There was no way for it to be a win-win situation. If I look back and I just look today and I ask the question, where was the snag? Where did it really start to go awry? Where I started having little niggly feelings. I'm not sure if this partnership's gonna work. Do you know what it was? Um, there was no one page signed partnership agreement. I had it done. I emailed it to them numerous occasions. They wouldn't sign it even though they agreed to it on the phone. There was verbal agreement, but not a signature. You need to test your partnerships. If you can't get a simple signature saying, this is what I'm going to do and this is what you're going to do, then it's probably not going to work in the future because the person isn't really serious. They say they're serious, but they're not willing to do something. Um, we uh, kind of let partnerships fizzle 
when we can't even get to the point of a signature. Uh, we had three gentlemen that we were trying to partner with in the, in the, uh, in the hemp and CBD space, and uh, we were excited about it. They were excited about it. <clears throat> we, uh, we tested the partnership and said, we'd like for you to send out one email to your database. We concocted it. They agreed to it. They said they would send it out. We waited and we waited and we waited and we're still waiting and we canceled the partnership. We just didn't do anything else because we were testing to see whether or not they were serious about the partnership. You need to test your potential partners to ensure that they are the right people. So in conclusion, is the shock value. There's no perfect or best partnership style. <laughs> There's only options. And hopefully, because we shared four of them with you, you realize that there's a lot more partnership options than maybe what you've thought about in the past. So you need to recognize that there's a belief system behind each of those styles, and that allows you to embrace different options and familiarize yourself with the best option for every situation. Because sometimes the situation dictates the style of partnership that you need to have. There are, look at that word, please underline that, circle that, star that. There are always non-verbalized expectations that come with partnership discussions. I'm, I'm shocked when I start to have a partnership discussion, when something comes out of my mouth that I don't know that I believe, that all of a sudden I hear myself say, and you'll be shocked. That's the shock value. When you hear your partner say something you didn't know they did believed. And when these preconceived notions are magnified, you don't sometimes know what to do. It kind of creates ambiguity because if you're committed at this level and you think the other person is committed at this level and their level of commitment is down here or down here and yours is up here, <laughs> sometimes it's shocking because you say, but I thought you were committed like I am. And the person said, you know, I really just don't believe as much as you do. And that means that you may need to take that partnership and take it to another style that works best for that person. So in part two is gonna be on June the 2nd, Mountain Standard Time, 12 to one, we're gonna discuss, there's four different areas, recruiting, screening, hiring, and retaining of your most important internal partners, which is called your staff. It's inside your organization where your greatest partnerships are formed that can last a lifetime. You know, I've been blessed to start over 20 companies and have impacted people around the world. I lived in South Africa for seven years. Uh, I have had some of the most disastrous partnerships that, that would make your head spin and your hair stand up on end. That you would say, oh, David, you got betrayed so, so deeply. You lost hundreds of thousands and millions here and you lost this. Why are you still in partnership today? It's because I believe that the best way to grow an organization is by partnering with people that truly care about the industry that they're in. For me, that is the co-founders of the Hemp Business Advisors. It is because of my wife, Michaela Wilkinson, who is our co-founder and creative director, and our best friend, Carrie Cox, who's our corporate liaison. It is because of their belief in me and my belief in them, our belief in the industry and our belief in our expertise, that we formed some of the best partnerships that any of us have ever had in our lives. My encouragement to you is to find the people that are trustworthy. The people that no matter what style you may most gravitate to, that you would say to yourself when you wake up in the morning, you know what? This is an absolute astounding industry. I have the best partners I could possibly imagine. I love my life and I love the cannabis industry. And you will, because of those beliefs, you will create a foundation that will impact the world on behalf of an industry that has been suffering and suffocated for our lifetime, that hopefully will gain the freedom that it so deserves. My name is David Wilkinson. I am the co-founder and competitive strategist here at the Hemp Business Advisors. It was an honor and pleasure to spend this hour with you. May you be safe, may you be healthy, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.